Greetings to all you red pill men boldly living life in a blue pill world. It's time for part three of my treatment of the Fight Club movie. In this one, I want to focus quite a bit on the relationship between the narrator and his emergent alter ego, Tyler Durden, played by Brad Pitt. I think it's important to note here that Tyler has remained in the shadows until Marla came waltzing into the scene in her tattered party dress, triggering more dissonance than the narrator was prepared to handle. The narrator's weak, unassertive nature and his sexual-emotional longing smashed together like opposing tectonic plates. Tyler Durden's animation is the resultant earthquake. Tyler first appears in one of the narrator's flights, their relationship starting with him challenging the narrator's assumption of control and safety. He uses airline emergency procedures as a metaphor for the narrator's worldview, following rules, practicing obedience, and remaining complacent as the plane plummets to the ground. Tyler quickly takes command of the role of mentor and seals their introduction by passing the narrator a business card and offering the sage advice that you can make napalm from equal parts gasoline and orange juice concentrate. Later, the narrator comes home to find that his condo, and along with it all his precious belongings, have been blown to pieces in a natural gas explosion. As we've discussed earlier, it's not just his home that has been destroyed. It is a huge piece of his identity. The scene is also a foreshadow of what the narrator and Tyler together will visit on the world around them. He surveys the damage in a state of bewilderment, stopping to look at what remains of his refrigerator and its sparse contents. How embarrassing, he says, a house full of condiments and no food. It's a percipient statement, as though to say, a life full of things and no substance. And at this point, we get a reminder of the social vacuum that is the life of the narrator. Effectively homeless, he needs someone to call in the midst of this crisis. He is limited to Marla and Tyler, apparently the only two personal phone numbers he has. He fishes Marla's number out of the wreckage from the explosion and calls her from a payphone, but lacks the courage to speak and hangs up. Then he produces Tyler's business card, dials him and gets no answer. A moment later, the phone rings. Tyler has star 69 him back. It's worth a brief pause here to point out a couple of clues were being given to Tyler being a figment of the narrator's fractured personality. First, looking at Tyler's business card, we see his company address is on Paper Street. As it turns out, a Paper Street is a street that is on a map, but that does not, in reality, exist. Next, when Tyler star 69s, the quick eye will spot what's stated on the payphone. It says, no incoming calls allowed. Now, these are only two clues to Tyler's imaginary existence out of literally dozens of them that are scattered throughout virtually all the movie scenes. The two talk and then meet for a beer where Tyler again assaults the narrator's sensibilities, particularly about his possessions. The narrator seems intrigued but otherwise unaffected, and the two move on outside where Tyler pressures him to assert himself in this case, to ask him directly for a place to stay. He also invites the narrator to hit him, which he also eventually does. This moment in the film is pivotal in a couple of ways. One, and most obviously, it is the birth of the Fight Club. It is the spark that will eventually ignite a revolution, drawing countless other men to embrace their primal masculinity and to act that out on the society around them. And two, the moment instantaneously breaks the narrator of his addiction to his fraudulent, feminized self-help crutch. Both the beating he takes and the self-ownership of lashing out and smashing back against his opponent are unquestioningly his. No more vicarious leeching from the pain of others. No more touchy-feely, oprah circle of tears and no more sleepless nights. 
Incidentally, this is where we are also torn away from the scene for a quick look at Tyler's life as an antisocial warrior, splicing porn scenes in the family movies and pissing into the soup pots at his catering gigs. Next, the two of them, bonded by blood and bruises, head to Tyler's house on one of the dark and decaying lots of Paper Street. The house itself is another bold metaphor of so many in the movie. It's a massive, ramshackle affair with rotting infrastructure, rusty nails that protrude everywhere, faulty wiring and leaking, rusted pipes issuing filthy water. A perilous place with every step, it is Tyler's home, which of course also means it is unmistakably a representation of the narrator's unconscious mind, complete with stacks of hidden thoughts and memories in the form of old magazines and books. And it is with the use of this old literature that the movie is quite clever in its interpretation of events. Reader's Digest, first published in 1922 and still published today, included a regular health section. It featured various human organs speaking educationally about themselves in the first person. For example, I am Joe's prostate, or I am Jane's pancreas. The point was to teach readers about the functions of the human body and, importantly, what happens when things go wrong. In the screenplay, Joe was changed to Jack. Thus, I am Jack's raging bile duct. This is important to the film as the narrator uses it to describe what's going on in the movie and what is going wrong around him. I will be doing the same in the future with my analysis. Moving on, we come to yet another critical part of the movie. This is where Tyler and the narrator have a conversation about their childhoods, both of which are, of course, identical in the absence of a father. After all, the narrator and Tyler are one and the same. The subject of marriage comes up in the conversation, where we get a reminder not only of the narrator's chronic blue pill insecurity, but of the blue pill messaging that men have been pummeled with during the narrator's life. I can't get married, he says. I'm a 30-year-old boy. In one of the grander moments of the film, Tyler issues a patently red pill response. We're a generation of men raised by women, he says. I'm wondering if another woman is really the answer we need. Now, I'm going to come back to this later, but I want to say for right now that this moment, like all red pill moments in the film, is nothing more than an expertly crafted red herring. And I must immediately call into question my use of the word expertly. Unconsciously crafted would be the better term. Fight Club, as the Chuck Palahniuk novel, as the Jim Ohl screenplay, and as the David Fincher film, is the product of blue pill men. Their blue pill mindset, their psychologically castrated worldview, shines through the rest of the movie, destroying all potential for a red pill outcome. They skirted close enough to the red pill meaning to resonate with a red pill audience somewhat, but that is just a testament to the incredible power of the red pill narrative. Even a hint of it goes a long way. We see this as the fight club progresses to being a regular thing on Saturday nights, drawing in men from all corners of life, white collar and blue, black and white, establishment, and more underworld types. It is pulling men in in numbers, all of them escaping their drab, comfortably numb existence in favor of connecting to the pain of being fully alive. And we see what this whiff of red pill existence does for the narrator. He tells us as much as he ambles without a care down the sidewalk, face tattooed with cuts and scrapes. It used to be that when I came home angry and depressed, I'd just clean my condo, he says, polish my Scandinavian furniture. I should have been looking for a new condo. I should have been haggling with my insurance company. I should have been upset about my nice, new, flaming little shit. But I wasn't. Of course, the narrator doesn't have a clue of what is coming down the pike. 
because this is where the blue pill reality under the red pill facade begins rising to the top, starting with the antithesis to red pill life for men, organization. And much more than that, where Tyler does what all blue pill alpha men do, by laying down the rules. All that and a lot more coming up in the next installment of this series. As always, thanks for stopping by to listen. I hope you've enjoyed, even if you haven't. And we'll see you next time. (laughs) 